Chapter 18 Hotter and hotter grew that stifling spell, more and more languid men and beasts, drier and drier the parching earth. All the water gave out on the morning after I had bearded Arhap in his den, and our strength went with it. No earthly heat was ever like it, and it drank our vitally up, vitality up from every pore. Water there was down below in the bitter streaming gulf, but so noisome that we dared not even bathe there. Here there was none but the faintest trickle. All discipline was at an end. All desire save such was born of thirst. Haru and I, Haru I saw as often as I wished as she lay gasping with poor sigh at her feet in the woman's veranda, but the heat was so tremendous that I gazed at her with lackluster eyes, staggering to and fro amongst the courtyard shadows, without nerve to plot her rescue or strength to carry out anything my mind might have conceived. We prayed for rain and respite. Arhap had prayed with a wealth of picturesque ceremonial. We had all prayed and cursed by turns, but still the heavens would not relent, and the rain came not. At last the stifling heat and vapor reached an almost intolerable pitch. The earth reeked with unwholesome humors no common summer could draw from it. The air was sulfurous and heavy, while overhead the sky seemed a tawny dome, from edge to edge of angry crowds, clouds parting now and then to let us see the red disk threatening us. Hour after hour slipped by until, when evening was upon us, the clouds drew together and thunder, with a continuous low rumble, began to rock from sky to sky. Fitful showers of rain, odorous and heavy but unsatisfying, fell, and birds and beasts of the woodlands came slinking in to our streets and courtyards. Ever since the sky first darkened, our own animals had become strangely familiar and now here were these wild things of the woods, slinking in for companionship, shag-headed and frightened. To me especially they came, until that last evening as I staggered dying about the streets or sat staring in the remorseless, into the remorseless sky from the steps of Haru's prison house. All sorts of beasts drew softly in and crowded about. Whether I sat or moved, all asked for the hope I had not to give them. At another time, this might have been embarrassing. Then it seemed pure commonplace. It was a sight to see them slink in between the useless showers, which fell like hot tears upon us, sleek panthers with lolling tongues, russet red wood dogs, bears and sloths from the dark arcades of the remote forests, all casting themselves down, gasping in the palace shadows, strange deer who staggered to the garden plots and lay there, heaving with their lives out, mighty boars who came from the river marshes and slightly nozzled a place amongst their enemies to die in. Even the wolves came off the hills and, with bloodshot eyes and tongues that dripped foam, flung themselves down in my shadow. All along the tall stockades, apes sat sad and listless, and on the roof ridges, storks were dying. Over the branches of the trees, whose leaves were as thin as though we had a six-month drought, the toucans and Martian parrots hung limp and fashionless like gaudy rags, and in the courtyard ground the, court, the corn rats came up from their tunnels in the scorched earth to die, squeaking in scores along, and along under the walls. Our common sorrow made us as sociable as though I were Noah, and our haps palace mound together mound another Ararat. Hour after hour I sat amongst all these lesser beasts in the hot darkness, waiting for the end. Every now and then the heavy clouds parted, changing the gloom to a sudden fiery daylight as the great red eye in the west looked upon us through the crevice, and taking advantage of those gleams I would reel across to where, under a spout leading from a dried rivulet, I had placed a cup to collect the slow and tepid drops that were all now coming down the reed for Haru. And as I went back each time with that sickly spoonful at the bottom of the vessel, all the dying beasts lifted their heads and watched, the thirsty wolves shambling after me, the boars half sat up and grunted plaintively, the panthers too weak to rise, beat the dusky, dusty ground with their tails, and from the portico the blue storks with trailing wings croaked husky greetings. But slower and slower came the dripping water, more and more intolerable the heat, at last I could stand it no longer. 
What purpose did it serve to lay gasping like this, dying cruelly without a hope of rescue, when a shorter way was at my side? I had not drank for a day and a half, and I was past active reviling. My head swam, my reason was clouded. No, I would not stand it any longer. Once more I would take Haru and pour Sai, the cup that was all but a mockery after all, then fix my sword into the ground and try what next the fates had in store for me. So once again the leathern mug was fetched and carried through the prostate guards to where the Martian girl lay, like a withered flower upon her couch. Once again I moistened those fair lips while my own tongue was black and swollen in my throat. Then told Sai, who had none all afternoon, to drink half and leave half for Haru. Poor Sai put her aching lips to the cup and tilted it a little. Then it passed to her mistress, and Haru drank it all, and Haru Sai cried a few hot tears behind her hands, for she had taken none, and she knew that it was her life. Again, picking away through the courtyard, scarce noticing how the beasts lifted their heads as I passed, I went instinctively, instinctively, cup in hand, to the well, and then hesitated. Was I a coward to leave Haru so? Ought I not stay and see it out to the bitter end? Well, I would compound with fate. I would give the malicious gods one more chance. I would put the cup down again, and until seven drops had fallen into it, I would wait. That there might be no mistake about it. No sooner was the mug in place under the nozzle wherefrom the moisture, be moisture beads collected and fell with infinite slowness that than my sword on which I meant to throw myself was barred and the hilt forced into a crack, gaping crack in the ground. And sullenly contented to leave my fate so, I sat down beside it. I turned grimly to the spout and saw the first drop fall, then another and another later on. But still no help came. There was a long rift in the clouds now, and a glare that, like from an open furnace door, was upon me. I had noticed that when I came to the spring, how the comet which was killing us hung poised exactly on a point of a distant hill. If he had passed his horrible meridian, if he was going from us, if he sunk but a hair's breadth before that seventh drop should fall, I could tell it would mean salvation. But the fourth drop fell, and he was big as ever. The fifth drop fell, and a hot, pleasing nose was thrust into my hand, and looking down I saw a grey wolf had dragged herself across the courtyard, and was asking with eloquent eyes for the help I could not give. The sixth drop, drop gathered, and fell. Already the seventh was like a speeding, seeding pearl in its place. The dying wolf yanked affectionately at my hand, but I put her by and undid my tunic big and bright that drop hung into the spout lip. Another minute and it would fall, a beautiful drop. I laughed, peering closely at it, many-colored, prismatic, flushing red and pink, a tiny living ruby hanging by a touch to the green rim above. Enough! Enough! The quiver of an eyelash would unhinge it now, and angry with the life I had already felt was behind me, and turning in defiant expectation to the new, new to come, I rose, saw the red gleam of my sword jutting like a fiery spear from the cracks, crack soil where I had planted it, then looked once more at the drop and glanced for the last time at the sullen red terror on the hill. Were my, eye, were my eyes dazed? My senses reeling? I said a space ago that the meteor stood exactly on the mountain top, and if it sunk a hair's breadth, I should note it. And now, why, there was a flaw in its lower margin, a flattening of the great foot that before had been round and perfect. I turned my smarting eyes away a minute, saw the seventh drop fall with a melodious tingle into the cup. Then back again. There was no mistake. The truant fire was a fraction less. It had shrunk a fa fraction behind the hill ever, ever even since I looked, looked. And thereon, all my life ran back into its channels. The world danced before me. And, hurroo, I shouted hoarsely, reeling backwards towards the palace. Hurroo, tis well, the worst is past. But the little princess was unconscious, and at her feet was poor Sai, quite dead, still reclining with her head in her hands, just as I had left her. Then my own senses gave out, and dropping down by them, I remembered no more. I must have lain there an hour or two, for when consciousness came again, it was night, black, cool, 
profound night, with an inky sky low down upon the treetops, and out of it such a glorious deluge of rain descending swiftly and silently to, as filled my veins even to listen to. Eagerly I shuffled away to the porch steps, down them into the swimming courtyard, and ankle deep in the glorious flood set to work, lapping furiously at the first puddle, drinking with gasps of pleasure, gasping and drinking again, feeling my body filling out like the thirsty, steaming earth below me. Then, as I still drank insatiably, there came a gleam of lightning out of the gloom, overhead a brilliant yellow blaze, and by it I saw a few yards away a panther drinking at the same pool as myself, his gleaming eyes low down like mine upon the water, and by his side two apes, the black water running in at, at, at their gaping mouths, while, while out beyond were more pools, more drinking animals, Everything was drinking. I saw their outlined forms, the gleam shining on wet skins as though they were cut out in silver against the darkness, each beast steaming like a volcano as the heaven-sent rain smoked from his fevered hide, all drinking for their lives, heedless of aught else, and then came the thunder. It ran across the cloudy vault as though the very sky were being ripped apart, rolling in mighty echoes here and there before it died away. As it stopped, the rain also fell less heavily for a moment, and as I lay with my face low down, I heard the low, contented lapping of the numberless tongues, unceasing, insatiable. Then came the lightning again, light, lighting up everything as though it were daytime. The twin black apes were still drinking, but the panther across the puddle had had enough. I saw him lift his grateful head up to the flare, saw the limp red tongue licking the black nose, the green eyes sh shining like opals, the water dripping in threads of diamonds from the hairy tag under his chin, and every tuft upon his chest, then darkness again. To and fro the green blaze rocked between the thunder crashes. It struck a house a hundred yards away, stripping every, sing every shingle from the roof better than a master builder could in a week. It fell a minute after on a tall tree by the courtyard gate, and as the trunk burst into white splinters, I saw every leaf upon the feathery top turn light side up against the violet reflection in the sky beyond, and then the whole mass came down to earth with a thud that, crush, that crushed the courtyard pal palings into nothing for twenty yards and shook me even across the square." Another time I might have stopped to marvel or to watch, as I have often watched with sympathetic pleasure the gods thus at play. But tonight there were other things on hand. When I had drunk, I picked up an earthen crock, filled it, and went to Haru. It was rough. It was a rough drinking vessel for those dainty lips, and an indifferent draught, being as much mud as aught else, but its effect was wonderful. At the first touch of that turgid stuff, a shiver of delight passed through the drowsy lady. At the second she gave a sigh, and her hand tightened on my arm. I fetched another crockful, and by the flickering light rocking to and fro in the sky, she took her, ha her head upon my shoulder, like a prodigal new come into riches, squandering the stuff, giving her to drink and bathing face and neck, till presently to my delight the princess's eyes opened. Then she sat up, and taking the basin from me, drank as never lady drank before, and soon was almost herself again. I went out into the portico, there snuffling the deep, strong breath of the fragrant black earth, receiving back into its gas ga gaping self what the last few days had taken from it, while click quickly quick succeeding thoughts of escape and flight passed across my brain. All through the fiery time we had just had the chance of escaping, with the fair booty yonder had been had been present. Without her, flight would have been easy enough, but that was not worth considering for a moment. With her, it was more difficult. Yet, as I watched the woodsman, accustomed to cool forest shade, faint under the fiery glare of the world above, to make a dash for liberty seemed each hour more easy. I had seen the men in the streets drop one by one, and the spears fall from the hands of guards about the palisades. I had seen messengers who came to and fro collapsed before their errands were accomplished, and the forest women, who were Haru's gaolers, groan and drop across the thresholds of her prison, until at length the way was clear. A babe might have taken what he would of from that half-scorched town, and asked no man's leave. Yet what did it avail me? Haru was helpless. My own spirit burnt in the nerveless frame, and so we stayed." 
But with rain, strength came back to both of us. The guards, lying about like black logs, were only slowly returning to consciousness. The town still slept and darkness favored. Before they missed us in the morning, light we might, light, we might be far on the way back to Seth. A dangerous way, truly but we were like to tread a rougher one if we stayed. In fact, directly my strength returned with cooler air, I made up my mind to the venture and went to Haru, who by this time was much recovered. To her I whispered my plot, and that gentle lady, as only natural, trembled at its dangers, but I could but I put it to her that no time could be better than the present. The storm was going over, morning would be lying in the black mantle of the night with a pink dawn of promise. Before any one stirred, we might be off, might be far off, shaping a course by our luck and the stars for her kindred, at whose name she sighed. If we stayed, I argued, the king changed his then and the king changed his mind, then death for me and for Haru the arms of that surly monarch, and all the rest of her life caged in those palisades amongst the uncouth forms about us. The lady gave a frightened little shiver at the picture, but after a moment, laying her head upon my shoulder, answered, O oh, my guardian, spirit, and helper in adversity, I too have thought of the tomorrow, and doubt whether that horror, that great swine who has me, will not invent an excuse for keeping me. Therefore, the forest roads are dreadful. Therefore, though the forest roads are dreadful, and Seth very far away, I will come. I give myself into your hands. Do what you will with me. Then the sooner the better, princess. How soon can you be prepared? She smiled, and stooping, picked up her slippers, saying, as she did so, I am, all, I am ready. There were no arrangements to be made. Every instant was of value. So, to be brief, I threw a dark, dark cloak over the damsel's shoulders, for indeed she was clad in little more than her loveliness and the gauziest filaments of Hither's girl's underwear, and hand in hand led her down the log steps, over the splashing ankle-deep courtyard, and into the shadows, shadows of the gateway beyond. Down the slope we went, along the harbour, through a score of deserted lanes that were where nothing was to be heard but the roar of rain and the lapping of men and beasts, drinking in the shadows as though they had never would stop, and so we came at last unmolested, um, unmolested to the wharf. There I hid royal Seth between two piles of merchandise, and went to look for a boat suitable to our needs. There were plenty of small craft moored to rings along the quay, and selecting a canoe, it was no time to stand on niceties of property, easily managed by a single paddle, I brought it round to the steps, put it in a, in a fresh water pot, and went for the princess. With her safe, safely stowed in the prow, a helpless, sodden little morsel of feminine loveliness, things began to appear more hopeful, and an easy escape and an escape down to blue water, my only idea, for the first time possible. Yet I must needs go and well nigh spoil everything by over -sol solicitude for my charge. Had we pushed off at once, there could be no doubt my credit as a spirit would have been established for all time in the thither capital, and the belief universally held that Haru had been wafted away by my enchantment to the regions of the unknown. The idea would have gradually grown to a tradition receiving embellishments in succeeding generations, until little wooden children at their mother's knees came to listen in awe of the story of how, once upon a time, the sun god loved a beautiful maiden and drove his fiery chariot across the black night fields to her prison door, scorching to death all who strove to gainsay him. How she flew into his arms and drove away before all man's eyes in his red car into the west and was never seen again. The foresaid sun god being I, Culliver Jones, as much underpaid uh, lieutenant in the glorious United States Navy, with a packet of overdue tailor's bills in my pocket and nothing lovable about me save a partiality for meddling with other people's affairs. This is how it might have been but I spoiled a pretty fairy story and changed the whole course of Martian history by going back at that moment in search of a rap for my prize. Right on top of the steps was a man with a lantern, and half a glance showed me it was the harbor master met with on my first landing. Good evening, he said suspiciously. May I ask what you are doing on this on the quay on this such hour as this? Doing? Oh, nothing in particular. Just going out for a little fishing. And your companion, the lady, is she too fond of fishing? I swore beneath between my teeth, but could not prevent the fellow 
walking to the key edge and casting his light full upon the figure of the girl below. I hate people who interfere with other people's business. Unless I am very much mistaken, your fishing friend is the hither woman brought here a few days ago as tribute to Arhap. Well, I answered, getting into a nice temper, for I had been very much harassed of late. Put it at that. What would you, what would you do if it were so? Call up my rain-drunk guard and give you in charge as a thief caught meddling with a king's property. Thanks, but in, as my interviews with Arhap have already begun to grow tedious, we will settle this little matter here between ourselves at once. And without more to do, I closed with him. There was a brief scuffle, and then, then I got in a blow upon his jaw, which sent the harbour master flying back head over heels amongst the sugar bales and potatoes. Without waiting to see how he fared, I ran down the steps, jumped on board, loosened the rope, and pushed out into the river. But my heart was angry and sore, for I knew as I turned for as I knew, as I turned out to be the case, that our secret was no long was no more. In a short time we should have the savage king in his in pursuit, and now there was nothing but for it but a headlong flight, with only a small chance of getting away to distant Seth. Luckily, the harbour master lay insensible until he was found at dawn, so that we had a good start, and the moment the canoe passed from the arcade-like approach to the town, the current swung her head automatically seaward, and away we went downstream at a pace once more filling me with hope. 